Now that Mr Rochester is back in residence at Thornfield Hall, the place is busier and brighter. Jane Eyre's days have certainly become more interesting thanks to her talks with Mr Rochester. In fact, she has become his confidant. One afternoon, while enjoying some fresh air with Adele and Pilot, Jane is joined by the master himself. He's ready to open up about Adele's origins. She's the daughter of Céline Varons, a Parisian opera dancer with whom Mr Rochester had a passionate and very expensive affair. When the affair ended due to Céline's infidelity, Mr Rochester was unable to cut ties. Céline claimed that Adele was his daughter. She was only a baby at the time, but now it's obvious that Adele looks nothing like him. Céline abandoned Adele when she was only a toddler, dumping her with a poor family in Paris. When Mr Rochester heard about this, he extracted Adele and brought her to England. Even though he's not fond of children and certain that she's not his daughter, Mr Rochester is committed to Adele's wholesome upbringing at Thornfield. After hearing this story, Jane feels more compassion for Adele than ever before, and since Mr Rochester has become so welcoming, although still moody, Jane's feelings towards him also deepen. She worries that he'll leave Thornfield and won't return for months. Oh dear, is Jane in love? But there are other things to worry about. That night, at around 2am, Jane hears someone outside her room. It can't be Pilot, because the person is laughing. <laughs> that same creepy laughter Jane's heard before. Except... It's not coming from the third story. It's coming through her keyhole. Is Grace Poole the seamstress playing an evil trick? When Jane leaves her room to tell Mrs Fairfax, she realises the hallway is full of smoke and it's coming from Mr Rochester's room. Jane dashes in and sees his bed on fire, with him asleep in it. Jane screams at him to wake up and runs in and out with jugs and basins full of water. Finally, Jane puts out the fire. Phew! Meanwhile, a saturated Mr Rochester comes too and slowly realises what's happened. After a brief investigation, they conclude that Grace Poole is to blame. After all, she's the only one who laughs like that. But Mr Rochester tells Jane to stay quiet about the whole thing. Don't even tell Mrs Fairfax. When Jane makes to leave, Mr Rochester seems unable to let her go. He becomes very intense, overwhelmed by the fact that Jane just saved his life. Unsure how to respond, Jane makes an excuse to go back to her own room. But she's unable to sleep that night. Dare she hope for his love? The following day, Jane looks in on the repairs happening in Mr Rochester's room. Leah is scrubbing the smoke off the windows and there, sitting next to the bed, is Grace Poole. Cool as a cucumber, she tells Jane that Mr Rochester started the fire by accident. He fell asleep with the candle burning next to the bed curtain. Luckily, he woke up in time and managed to extinguish the flames himself. Grace doesn't even flinch as these lies flow from her lips. When Jane mentions the laughter she heard, Grace Poole says she must have heard it in a dream. Then, to top it off, she advises Jane to bolt her bedroom door in future. The nerve! Grace Poole must be some kind of psychopath. The question is, what does she have on Mr Rochester that makes him protect her like this? Instead of having her arrested, he's covering up her crimes. Jane hopes to see Mr Rochester that day so she can ask him about it, but she's left disappointed. He'd left Thornfield early that morning and might not be back for over a week. He's gone to visit his high society friends, including the beautiful Miss Blanche Ingram. Blanche who? Mrs Fairfax describes Blanche Ingram's dark beauty in excruciating detail. 
Not only is she high-born, but she's also stunning and accomplished. The love that Jane has nurtured in her heart for the last two weeks turns to poison. She feels silly and ashamed to have thought she could win the love of a man like Edward Rochester. Fool! Not in a million years! To help herself grasp reality, she paints two portraits, one of herself and one of Blanche as Mrs Fairfax described her. Comparing the two is enough to squash her hopes for Mr Rochester. Well, sort of. During Mr Rochester's absence, Jane considers resigning from Thornfield. But this is soon forgotten when a note arrives from Mr Rochester. He's returning in a few days with a big group. All the best bedrooms are to be prepared. Mrs Fairfax must hire extra staff. Thornfield Hall becomes as busy as a beehive. Adele's lessons are even paused while Jane helps Mrs Fairfax with the preparations. Although Jane still keeps an eye on Grace Poole's strange, solitary movements. On one occasion, Jane overhears the servants discussing Grace Poole's ridiculously high salary. They seem to understand that she has an important job in the house, but they drop the subject when they notice Jane listening. What the devil is going on around here? And why does everyone seem to know about it except Jane? But there's no time to play detective. The grand party soon descend on Thornfield Hall and everyone is busy attending to their needs. Jane is eager to catch a glimpse of Blanche to see if she really is as beautiful as Mrs Fairfax described. When Jane and Adele are summoned to the drawing room on the second night, Jane gets her chance. When the splendid ladies enter after dinner, Jane can see that, yes, Blanche really is that beautiful. But like her mother, Lady Ingram, she is haughty and proud. And from the way she interacts with Adele and one of the older ladies, it's clear that Blanche is not a nice person. When the men enter the room and Jane sees Mr Rochester, all her hard work at squashing her love comes undone. He doesn't even look at her, but that's irrelevant. She is in love with him, and that's that. Jane stays half hidden behind the window curtain, but she can hear everything that's said. When Blanche sidles up to Mr Rochester and starts talking about Adele's education, Jane listens in. The conversation quickly diverts to the topic of governesses, and Blanche doesn't hold back, nor does her rude mother. Knowing full well that Jane is listening, Blanche describes governesses as detestable, ridiculous, and a general nuisance. She then gleefully recalls how she tormented all her governesses and got them all fired. It's official. Blanche is a brat. She then commands Mr Rochester to sing while she plays piano. While Blanche warms up her fingers on the keys, she loudly describes her taste in men and what kind of husband she desires. Clearly, she's zeroing in on Mr Rochester and he seems to be enjoying the attention. Jane stays to listen to Mr Rochester sing, then slips out by a side door but Mr Rochester intercepts her in the hallway and asks her how she's been. He remarks that she's become paler and seems depressed. Jane denies it, but he can see the tears in her eyes. Then, as he bids her good night, his tone becomes more intimate, but he stops himself before he says too much. What a way to mess with Jane's head! Unfortunately, Jane is also required to keep showing up for Mr Rochester's guests, which means she's forced to watch him and Blanche flirt and carry on. During a game of charades, they even have a mock wedding. Jane spends hours in their presence, and Mr Rochester barely looks at her. You'd think that this would kill the passion Jane feels for him, but no. Interestingly, she doesn't even feel very jealous of Blanche. 
What pains her is that Mr Rochester seems to prefer Blanche, even though she's inferior. Not in rank, but in character. Blanche isn't a good person. She isn't even very clever. She's showy and artificial. And she's really nasty to Adele. She thinks Mr Rochester is dazzled by her, but Jane can clearly see that's not the case. Blanche couldn't charm Mr Rochester if her life depended on it. And yet, Jane is sure he will marry Blanche, even though he doesn't love her. Jane concludes that it must be a gentry thing, something to do with the Ingrams' rank and connections. So, since Blanche's love isn't real and Jane's is, her passion for Mr Rochester lives on. When Mr Rochester is called away on business one day, the life goes out of the party. Blanche becomes especially impatient for him to return and scolds Adele for declaring a false alarm. Someone arrives at Thornfield Hall, but it's not Mr Rochester. When the stranger enters, he says he's an old friend of Mr Rochester's and will wait for him to return home. Jane notices his strange accent and gets a weird vibe from him. When she sees him again after dinner, she decides she doesn't like him at all. Meanwhile, the other ladies all agree he's terribly handsome. From her discreet little nook, Jane listens in and catches the stranger's name, Mr Mason. She also learns that he's come all the way from Kingston, Jamaica, where he'd first met Mr Rochester. What on earth was Mr Rochester doing over in Jamaica? He hates hot weather. While Jane ponders this, Sam the footman tells one of the gentlemen something odd. An old lady has arrived and refuses to leave. She's from the Romany travellers' camp down the road and insists on reading their fortune. Oh, what fun! Lady Ingram objects, but Blanche insists that they invite the old lady in. So she's installed in the library, ready to receive her clients. Since the fortune teller will only read for the young, single ladies, Blanche goes first. But after 15 long minutes, Blanche returns in a huff. She was obviously told something she didn't want to hear, but she doesn't say what. She declares the old lady an imposter and says she should be arrested. A group of three young ladies then go in together. They return with a very different story to tell. She knew so much about them. It was as if the old lady could read their thoughts. This excites everyone, except Blanche, as it seems they have a legit witch in the house. But now it's Jane's turn. Sam offers to stand in the hallway in case the old lady scares her, but Jane's not scared at all, only extremely curious. And so are we. Will the old woman see into Jane's future? Is Mr Rochester in it? Stay tuned to find out. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.